Live from downtown Detroit, Local 4 News at 5 starts now. A 16-year-old high school student is almost abducted and forcibly sexually assaulted on her way to school. What the suspect looks like so you might be able to help find him. All right, Nick, and grab the umbrellas. We have a lot of rain in the forecast coming up over the next few hours. Violence and chaos on the campus of Ohio State University. We're learning more about today's attacks that sent nine people to the hospital. And we'll start there today on Local 4 News at 5. Good to have you with us. New information now coming to light about the man who drove his car into a group of pedestrians and then started stabbing people with a butcher knife on the campus of Ohio State in Columbus. It is being investigated as a possible terrorist attack. Right now we know of nine injuries. None are fatal but one is critical. The suspect was an Ohio State student named Abdul Ali Artan. He was born in Somalia, but was living in the U.S. as a legal permanent resident. Our Rod Maloney is in Columbus tonight, where there is still no doubt a lot of shock over what happened. Indeed, Rod, what's the latest in, and how close are you to where that attack happened? Start with the latest, and we believe the number to be 11 people who actually ended up hurt and hospitalized. One person with a fractured skull from the accident that happened right down the alleyway. If you can see the van with the swoopy colors, different colors, the red, the gray, and the white. Just beyond it and down, there's a right-hand turn. It's called 19th Street, and that's where it occurred. Now, the police are saying that the attacker, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll want to name him again as Abdul Razik Ali Artan, was actually sitting in a car when a fire alarm went off and people were coming out. Now, whether he pulled the alarm or not is still in question, but there's no doubt about what happened and the people who saw it were desperately shaken. Pittsburgh native and welding engineering student Martin Schneider had just left Watts Hall in that fire drill. He was there and saw the chaos break out all around him. At first I thought it was a freak accident. You know, maybe just the guy driving the car, he had a seizure or something. Just happened to drive, hit the curb, drive through a crowd of people. But, you know, after he pulls out the knife, runs after people, you, you really notice that it's not just an accident. It's uh, really scary. Another unnamed Ohio State University student saw the back end of the attack. I was going to class and just saw people running and was nervous. I was like, oh crap. So, and then explain how you were able to see a body. I walked towards where people were running from. Schneider did not get much of a good look at the attacker because, well, he ran and found his way back into Watts Hall with a professor who had been attacked and was wounded. Well, I don't know how he got hit, but his ankle was injured. It was bleeding. Uh, I fled with the professor to the basement of Watts Hall. Me, I was there, maybe like three or four other students. and. You know, we just told the professor to sit down. There was considerable chaos around the area. Armed police officers swarmed a nearby parking garage, thinking there may have been more people involved in the attack. Two men were arrested, but in the end, they were not involved at all. Now, understand that, that Schneider and that professor and three or four other students were sitting in the basement here at Watts Hall. Watts Hall. It took another 20 minutes for paramedics to get to them in order to bring that professor over to the hospital who had been cut rather severely. And so there is a lot of concern here tonight, a lot of, uh, of anger, frustration, and, and concern here on the part of students. In fact, coming up on Local 4 News at 6, we're going to be talking to some students here about their reaction to all of this and what it was like for them when that tweet went out that alerted them that they need to be deeply concerned about their safety. Back to you. In fact, Rod, we're going to get to that uh, that alert that went out from the university in a minute, but it does seem uh, that as panic-stricken as it's a lot of people obviously took the right steps It seemed to react in the, in the way that you would hope they would. Well, absolutely, and in fact, it was a police officer who was investigating a gas leak, an Ohio State University police officer who was in the area just checking on a gas leak call that had come in. He was there, got the call, and got down to the uh, to 19th Street here, basically, and was able to get to the person swinging the butcher's knife. We're told by eyewitnesses that he told him to put the knife down. He did not, and that's where the officer shot him and killed him right there on the spot. He is being lauded tonight for stopping what amounts to a terrorist attack. All right, back to Rod here coming up a little later on, but now back to this uh, tweet. When OSU tweeted this morning, there was an active shooter on campus. The university told students they should run, hide, fight. 
So I guess what exactly does that advice mean? That's a good question. Local 4 defender Karen Drew joins us in studio with that part of our coverage. Karen. All right, Devin and Kimberly, this is the tweet we're talking about. Buckeye alert, active shooter on campus, run, hide, fight. So you get this on your phone and really, what do you do? Well, we did talk with officials at the Detroit Crime Commission earlier, and they actually walked us through what we should do and also consider if we believe there could be an active shooter situation. If you can't find a way to get out of the building, uh, you can't find a place to hide, your best option is to fight them. Because look, they're there to do harm. They're going to take as many people out as they can. That's probably your best option. If a gunman is coming that way, I'm going to look for another way out. So this exit right here would be my first option. Okay, so you got that hallway. You could run down that way and get out of the area. Let's say you're running down that way and someone's coming. So now we have a second shooter coming this way. Uh, I'm going to look for, for windows. Okay. Uh, is there a window that opens out? Is there a window that can be broken? I think I would think, oh my gosh, go here and hide under a desk. Is that a good option? Well, th that's a possible option, but you're still going to be exposed here. So if the gunman is coming around looking uh, under desks, you're, you're going to be exposed. A better option would be uh, an office like this where you have a nice steel door and it's a place you can get in there and barricade. The best place to hide, one of the best places, is behind the door. Not uh, the desk. Not the desk. I would think that would be a better choice. Uh, I don't know. No, it, it, it puts you at a tactical disadvantage because if they come in, you have to get out from up under and behind that desk to engage engage your assailant. And you're going to be shot. And you're going to get shot in the process. They're going to see you coming. So not, you want to be place. prepared you while be prepared. hiding. You want to grab whatever you can to use as a weapon. Okay, I'm behind so the door. Oh, look here. I found an umbrella. If you have to use an umbrella, a lamp, keyboard, coffee cup, whatever you can get your hands on, if that person breaches the door, that becomes your weapon. And that is what's important. Anything can become a weapon or protect you. Take a look at this video. This was sent out from one of the students at Ohio State University. They were in a classroom. They piled up all these chairs by the door to protect themselves. So in that particular situation, they did what is right. All right, back to you. All right, thanks, Karen. We've got uh, much more to come, uh, more information as it continues to come out on this story, and especially more on the suspect at the center of all this. You can follow along with the latest developments at clickondetroit.com and on our Click on Detroit app as well. Well, it might be somewhat of a slow commute today because we are seeing rain in a lot of places out there. Yeah, exactly. Let's uh, see when this is going to clear out of here. Andrew's in for Ben tonight. Andrew? Hey, well, good afternoon, both of you. We talked about all holiday weekend long, and it's coming to fruition right now. We had a dry morning, but now rain is flowing in from the south this afternoon. Some of it heavy at times, especially in these pockets of yellow you see here. Now here in downtown Detroit, much of Wayne County, along 96, along the lodge, north and west of the city as you head toward Southfield, along 94 to the west as you head toward Allen Park, Romulus, and eventually Belleville. Same thing to our north and west for our friends and relatives over in Washtenaw County. Parts of Livingston County getting some of that heavier rain as well. So wet conditions, that's something we need to be aware of. Also ponding on roadways. A lot more moisture is flowing in from the south, but temperatures remain above freezing. Look at all four of our zones, well into the 40s, at least 10 degrees above freezing. And you know what? Temperatures stay in the 40s. So we're looking at wet conditions throughout the rest of the afternoon and for tonight. Not any frozen conditions. That at least is a good thing. Is there any rain for tomorrow? How warm or how chilly is it going to be for tomorrow and the rest of the week? We'll talk about that and your four zone weather. Got you covered in the metro zone, west zone, north and south as well. You can go to the weather page and click on Detroit.com for that. And I've got that forecast also in just a couple of minutes. Okay, Andrew, thank you. A St. Clair Shores High School student was able to help develop this sketch of a man. She says dragged her into his truck and began sexually assaulting her before she was able to escape. It happened just before 7 a.m. near 10 Mile and Cubberness. And as Nick Monticelli reports, police need your help. Well, good evening. There's a little bit of irony here because there were officers in the area already researching or investigating some car break-ins and then this 16 year old ran up to them and then they put two and two together that the suspect or person of interest could be the same person from both cases. You know we try to tell people you know you never know. Andy Alexu and his wife Betty have lived in their St. Clair Shores home for more than 20 years and never have they woken up to see this outside their front door. These officers are looking for any evidence that might help them find this man who might be responsible for attempting to kidnap a 16 year old and sexually assaulting her. Police believe he was in the 26,000 block of Harmon early this morning, stealing things from cars. That's what this home security video was from. While officers were investigating that, a 16 year old ran up and asked for help. 
She says she was walking to school when a man pulled up asking for directions. At some point he got out, grabbed her by the back of the neck and forced her into his truck. The suspect started driving and began to forcibly sexually assault her. Fortunately, she was able to fight back, jump out of the truck and run. Our top priority right now is to get the suspect off the streets because it's very distressing that he would be out here possibly trying to abduct our young or older, just harm anybody in our community. The girl is a student at Lakeview High School. An alert went out to parents this morning. The girl's backpack and band instrument were found about two miles away from here. But parents are understandably very concerned. I, I just can't describe how disgusting it is and I hope they get him. In St. Clair Shores, Nick Monticelli, Local 4. All right, Nick. Students and staff at Wayne State University are honoring the memory of Officer Colin Rose. The patrol car used by Officer Rose is now parked in the center of campus, decorated with an American flag and flowers. Students also painted a rock with the message RIP, rest in peace, Officer Rose. Many have signed a memorial banner that reads, we support those who protect and serve. Funeral arrangements have now been released for Officer Rose. A visitation is going to be held at Ford Field on Wednesday from 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. On Thursday, visitation will be held at St. Joan of Arc Church in St. Clair Shores. That will be from 10 to 11 a.m. And then the funeral mass immediately will follow at 11 a.m. Still ahead, the heartbroken family of a young woman killed while visiting Michigan issue a desperate plea for help in finding her killer. Also designing a better, safer seat belt, specifically for the group of Americans who are actually most likely to use them to begin with. Priya? Heartbreaking testimony today from the family of a man killed in a hit and run. They were in court today for the driver's sentencing, but a last minute decision by the judge means this case is far from over. We've got details coming up. Tonight, new at six. It was pouring rain just like this. Truck slides off the road, hits the guide wire for that power pole, pulling down power lines in the rain. The truck's on fire, but one man threw caution to the wind and saved a life. They didn't stop. You'll meet him coming up. If you have the perception that teenagers are only about selfies and what's in it for me, then you haven't met these teenagers. Not a lot of people know about Mask Cell, and I think it's very important to raise awareness and also help Miss Martin because of the battle she's facing. She can't face it alone. Who says you can't change the world? One life at a time. All right, Steve. It was an emotional day in court for the family of a man killed in a hit and run in Hazel Park. The driver was expected to be sentenced in the death of uh, Cordy Howlett, who was killed earlier this year. But after the family spoke in front of the packed courtroom, the Oakland County Circuit Judge made a surprise decision. Priya Mann following the story for us today and joins us now with more. Priya. And Devin, Judge Cheryl Matthews says she did not approve of the Cobb agreement reached between the prosecution and the defense, which means this case could go to trial, but it was still an emotional day for the victim's family who spoke in court. In closing, I just have to say, Joseph Matthew Dunning, you have a chance to make a choice now. Staring directly at Joe Dunning, Tracy Stalker held a picture of her brother, who she described as her first friend. I miss my brother, my friend. I felt empty and lonely. 54-year-old Cordy Howlett was killed in a hit and run in Hazel Park in October. The man was riding his bicycle near John R. and Woodward Heights. Police say Howlett did not have the right of way when he crossed John R. and was hit by a driver who took off. Whether you were drunk or you are distracted, whatever it was, you didn't stop. You left my brother to die in the middle. Ten days later, Joe Dunning turned himself into police. Prosecutors say Dunning had been drinking the night of the hit and run, but are unable to prove if Dunning was above the legal limit. The 50-year-old father of two was emotional as he apologized in front of the packed courtroom. And I know you think I'm a bad person, but I'm not. I was a bad person that day and a few days after that. And I just got forgiveness. It's in his hands. The former varsity basketball coach at Madison High School says he hopes others will learn from his mistake. I want to go back to these kids I've coached and tell them that I screwed up. There were a lot of tears in court today. Dunning had pleaded guilty to leaving the scene of an accident causing death, which is a five year felony. But now, with the judge's decision, Dunning is back in court next month. Reporting live, I'm Priya Mann, Local 4.
Okay, Priya. High schoolers in Detroit are making college a possibility with the help of the Detroit Promise. Registration for the 2017 scholarship launched today with the help of Governor Rick Snyder and Mayor Mike Duggan. The program helps provide graduates a tuition-free path to college. One of last year's recipients talked about how scholarships were hard for her to come by, but with the Promise, made going to De made, made going to U of M possible. I am a Detroit resident, but also I am a single child from a double dual household, from a double income household, which also during FAFSA kind of knocked me out of a lot of things, but still I am in need of a financial help. I am very happy for my first year to be debt free and loan free. And that's a huge accomplishment, something to be really excited about. More than 700 students are now attending college thanks to the Detroit Promise that was launched three years ago. So that's fantastic. <laughs> that's a big smile. Yeah, I'm going to guess there's some other people in that family <laughs> happening. Yeah, that's 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 right. Oh, and dad, too. Oh, Absolutely. Very soggy out there right now. Yeah, very soggy. I mean, imagine if this were all snow. We've seen that this time of year. Yeah. In fact, don't imagine. I'll, I'll imagine it for you, that's okay? Right. <laughs> Fortunately, it's all rain right now, and it remains all rain as we go through this evening. No concerns about snow or ice, even as we go through tonight, because we have warmer air moving in. Now, that being said, you always want to be careful on slick roads, whether it's because of snow, ice, or even rain. Wet roads can also be a problem. We also have some ponding out there. You want to avoid any standing water. Here's some of the heavier rain moving through places like Warren and Centerline, moving farther to the north and east at around 15, 20 miles per hour. So Sterling Heights, Utica, Romeo, you'll pick up some of this heavier rain within the next five to 15 minutes. Same thing in Mount Clemens. Batches of heavier rain here in yellow as well from Adrian uh, up through portions of Jackson County, western edge of uh, Washtenaw County, and in portions of Livingston County, you'll receive heavy rain if you're not getting it right now. The areas of green that you saw, those were areas of lighter rain. You can see more moisture down to our south through Indianapolis and parts of Ohio yet to move in. But take a look at your four zone weather, folks. You'll notice the good news. It remains wet, never becomes icy overnight. Winds out of the south pump in milder air. In fact, temperatures may rise overnight and by morning make it to the upper 40s or low 50s. Maybe here in the metro zone around 49 to 52 degrees. Same thing in our south zone, south of Michigan Avenue, west zone out, out toward Ann Arbor. Also areas west of 275, like in Brighton, up toward Flint, around 50 or 51 by morning. Even upper 40s and low 50s to our north as well. So everyone's in the same boat. Wet conditions over the next few hours and into the overnight hours, not icy or snowy conditions. 45 right now, it feels like it's in the 30s when you factor in these winds out of the southeast at around 11 miles per hour. It's about freezing everywhere, folks. 45 over in Port Huron. 43 for our friends in uh, Pontiac. 43 also in Dundee. And we stay in the 40s as we go through the rest of the evening. And these winds out of the south or southeast, that's what's bringing in the warmer air. Now, visibility is an issue, too. It's down a bit, still pretty manageable, but you want to be careful in spots where it's wet and also in spots where you got a lot of spray or mist and it's tough to see. Here's some of those warmer conditions down to our south, 57 in Columbus. We might be feeling some of those temps by tomorrow afternoon. A warm front bringing all the, all the moisture is also bringing the warmer air. Now, the warm air also comes with windy conditions because we'll be pretty close to this area of low pressure. So expect winds 10 to 20 miles per hour. If it's trash day today or tomorrow, make sure those cans aren't rolling down the street. We're looking at 49 degrees as a blended low for tonight. Low is in quotes because temperatures actually keep rising through the 50s, maybe near 60 degrees tomorrow. Feeling like springtime, but on the windy side. Some scattered showers, breezy still on Wednesday, still in the 50s. Then yes, December is right around the corner, so it does get chillier, but you'll notice those temperatures that you see, low 40s and around freezing at night, yeah. that's typical for this time of year. Mm -hmm. So not colder than average as we head to the end of this week and this weekend. Tomorrow's the get the Christmas lights out day. For the <laughs> get the right decorations but again, up. with those windy yeah. conditions, you well, always want to have a too. spotter on the ladder and yeah, you want to be, be careful. careful. Just take your time. Yep. All right. Thanks, Andrew. It's Cyber Monday, huge deals online, and here's the good news. Those deals will likely stick around much longer than you may expect. Okay, we'll have that coming up. Thanks, Hank. Plus, the video game a very underaged driver is said to have been playing just before going on a joyride. That story's coming up next. This year. In Canada, police were involved in a car chase that involved an 11-year-old boy. They turn emergency lights on, try to get the vehicle stopped. Vehicle accelerated, uh, and, and when we when that happened, we tried to get up beside the vehicle to take a look inside. And when they looked inside, what they saw was the 11-year-old boy.
who told police he had just finished playing Grand Theft Auto and wanted to see what driving a real car would be like. Police say he reached speeds as high as 75 miles per hour before finally being boxed in on the freeway. The boy and the car were returned home that night. No charges have been filed. Government of Cuba has started a nine day period of mourning for the death of revolutionary leader Fidel Castro. Cubans stood in long lines in Havana this morning to pay their respects to Castro. His revolution took him to power in 1959 and started a long course of putting him at odds with the United States. Seen by many as a brutal communist dictator, others uh, saw him as a hero. Once uh, one Havana resident says Cuba may change, but Castro's spirit will remain intact. We're not returning to capitalism. We're going to perfect our social economic system. We're going to do socialism with new philosophies. But many, of course, have their own guesses on where Cuba is headed. President Obama moved to reestablish diplomatic ties with Cuba. And there, of course, Fidel Castro's brother, Raul, who's now the leader. But President-elect Donald Trump says he might terminate that agreement unless Cuba makes more changes for its people and in its dealings with the U.S. In South Carolina, the man accused of killing nine black parishioners at a church in Charleston will represent himself during his federal trial. Today, a judge ruled Dylan Roof can act as his own lawyer. The judge, however, calling Roof's request, quote unquote, unwise. Lawyers will be in the court to advise Roof during the proceedings. The ruling came as jury selection continues. That process, though, is expected to take several more weeks. New at 530. Michigan's Board of Canvassers certified Donald Trump's victory in Michigan, but the counting isn't done. A group is demanding a hand recount. You'll hear their justification for asking for that and the GOP response. Plus, building a safer seatbelt. What's wrong with the current ones for the group most likely to buckle up? At the wrong place at the wrong time, a 19-year-old girl was killed in a drive-by shooting. Months later, her family is turning to Crime Stoppers, appealing to the public for help. Watch wheel. Live from downtown Detroit, Local 4 News at 5.30 starts now. The family of a young woman killed while visiting Metro Detroit issues an emotional plea tonight for help in finding her killer. The top story news at 5.30. When Anaya Edwards traveled here from Tennessee for a visit this past August, no one could have imagined the 19-year-old would never return home. In fact, she had only spent a few minutes with her friends in Pontiac before a car drove up and two men got out and started shooting. Now her family is desperate for answers. Our Priya Mann is live with what Anaya's mother and baby brother had to say. Priya? Karen, I've never seen this before. It was heartbreaking to watch this tiny child, just six years old, get up to the podium and start talking, start pleading with the public for information about his sister's unsolved murder. Naya was the, the best sister and she was, she was nice. She was kind of, she, she, she was everything. Roman Taylor is the epitome of an innocent child, yet the six-year-old boy is carrying the weight of his sister's unsolved murder. So anyone who can help, just help us and, and we're going to be okay. In August, 19-year-old Anaya Edwards was killed in a drive-by shooting in Pontiac. The teen was with friends in the 70 block of Thorpe Street when a gunman in a passing car opened fire. Three young men from Pontiac were injured. Anaya Edwards was killed. You know, I never in, my, in a million years would have thought that I would be standing up here doing a press conference for my daughter's murder. The 19-year-old had moved to Memphis with her family and was studying to become an anesthesiologist. She was trying to pay her way through school with a part-time job and had big plans for the future. When her main focus was to have this great career so she can take care of her brothers and they can come live with her for summers. You know, that's how... That's just who she was. Edwards came back to Michigan over the summer to visit family. Today, those loved ones made the ultimate plea. This is like became my, this has become my focus because I just I I won't rest until somebody is convicted for this. There's there's no explanation as to why she should be dead. 
and police say Anaya Edwards was simply at the wrong place at the wrong time, that she had absolutely nothing to do with this drive-by shooting. Now, Crime Stoppers is offering a $2,500 reward for information that leads to an arrest. If that information comes in tonight, they're adding another $1,000, bringing that reward up to $3,500. And of course, information the public gives will be anonymous. Reporting live, I'm Priya Mann, Local 4. Okay, Priya. We continue to follow breaking news out of Ohio, where we are learning more about the officer who used deadly force against an attacker on the Ohio State campus earlier today. The officer's 28-year-old Alan Harushko. He got to the scene within minutes of getting the word about the attack. Police say he demanded 18-year-old Abdul Artan drop his knife, but when Artan didn't, the officer fired three shots, killing Artan. Nine people were injured, but they are all expected to survive it and be okay. Police say the suspect is of Somalian descent, but is a legal resident. Uh, was a student at Ohio State. First responders and university response teams are being praised for the way that they handled today's situation. There was amazing coordination and the speed at which uh, these folks were able to come together, think about what this, uh, what this incident, what this tragedy could have meant. And we've got more coming up here at 6 o'clock. Our Rod Maloney is in Columbus on the Ohio State campus. He's uh, there talking to students who are still trying to figure out how they're going to cope and adjust to what happened this morning. Well, Andrew said that rain was coming and it is slowing down traffic definitely tonight and it's going to be with us for a while. Yeah, Andrew, what about it? And Karen and uh, Devin, I think that's the best advice you can give is actually take your time and because things are slowing down out there because of this rain that's falling. We've got temperatures way above freezing though and no concerns about any ice or frozen precipitation later on tonight because we stay in the 40s, maybe even near 50 degrees by morning. First, let's focus on the here and now, shall we? This is one of the great things about 4 Live Radar. You can zoom in close right to your neighborhood. Clawson, here's a look at Big B. Beaver Road, including the Troy area. Many folks may be still doing some shopping in Troy. You can see some uh, some heavier rain here showing up in yellow and in the areas of dark green. Same thing if you're doing some small shopping uh, in small businesses, that is, whether it's in the Gross Points or over in Birmingham, anywhere in Detroit or southeast Michigan, basically, because the entire area is filled with rain from light rain in the areas of light green to the heavier rain you see here in yellow in portions of Lenaway and Washtenaw County and more to come because it's still flowing in from the south. But temperatures are staying in the 40s and they stay that way throughout the rest of the evening. So watch your speeds out there and factor on extra time, no matter your destination for tonight. Coming up in a few moments, we'll talk about four zone weather. You can always get it at click on Detroit.com, but we'll go over the forecast for tonight with it and also talk about the next seven days coming up. All right, Andrew, now the latest on decision 2016. Michigan's presidential vote is now official. The state board of canvassers certifying Donald Trump won the state of Michigan by 10,704 votes. But the counting isn't done. The campaign of Green Party candidate Jill Stein indicated Wednesday it is going to officially demand the state's 4.8 million ballots undergo a manual recount. Uh, just one of several that may take place across the country in two other states, especially Guy Gordon joins us live with more Guy. Uh, Devin, uh, even internally, they're admitting this is the longest of Hail Mary passes. No recount at state history has ever shifted 10,000 votes, and she not only would have to do it here to overturn the Donald Trump victory, she would have to do it in Wisconsin and Pennsylvania as well, where the margin of victory is even larger. Nevertheless, they say that on Wednesday, they will go forward. All this from a candidate that barely got 1% of the vote in Michigan. I will say it is odd, to say the least. The State Board of Canvassers was already bracing for a recount while defending the integrity of the state system. As I don't believe there's any fraud, there will be mistakes, of course, but uh, I do not see any fraud. Stein's campaign offers no proof, but said a hand recount is necessary to ensure the integrity of the vote, citing Russian hacking of Democratic Party emails, the possibility optical tabulators could be infected with malware, and potential misreads. Over 80,000 ballots cast, which there's no recorded vote for president. The only way to determine whether there was a vote for president on those ballots that the machine did not read is to manually recount them. GOP leaders are threatening a formal objection. This will cost our taxpayers, it will cost our counties, it will take time, it is disenfranchising our voters, and it is an outrage. Stein's team will submit a half dozen affidavits from experts on the system's vulnerabilities, including U of M computer science professor Alex Halderman, who said last week, quote, 
Were this year's deviations from pre-election polls the result of a cyber attack? Probably not. But he will detail how it could be done and says the only evidence is if you do a recount to show that there was no hacking and no skullduggery. So they will move ahead with it. Here's how it will go down. Wednesday, they will submit the petition to have the recount. They will also submit an $800,000 check from the Stein campaign to pay for it. Then, barring any objections, uh, the state elections director says they expect to start counting in 19 different counties on Friday or Saturday. That gives them only 12 days, December 13th, the hard deadline. We're live. I'm Guy Gordon, Local 4. Devin, it's a tall order. It sure is. In fact, Guy, you and I were talking about this in the newsroom. The time table here is very, very tight, and you have to wonder that, whether they can get the count done. Well, and, and they, they say December 13th is the hard deadline in order to get it to the Electoral College by the 19th and have Michigan's electors vote. However, uh, Republican Party uh, attorneys were there today saying, look, in Detroit, there have been three mayoral recounts, and they took 30 days. Yeah. In this case, they have only 12. And again, that's if they start Friday or Saturday. And if there's an objection, it will delay it even further. That's why, as you said, it is a tall order indeed. All right, Guy. In good health tonight, designing a safer seatbelt. Right now, there are more than 36 million drivers over the age of 65. And because of outdated designs, many are at a higher risk of being injured by equipment intended to keep them safe. Well into her 70s, Helen Kessler still feels confident on the road, but she's not always comfortable behind the wheel because of her seatbelt. I just put it across me and it usually goes across here, but by the time I get done driving, it's up closer here and I just pull it down each time. Decades ago, seatbelts were designed to protect the average driver, then a 40-year-old man. Now, drivers are far more diverse, and seatbelts can be less effective. It's not enough to keep someone my size maybe back in my seat, and it's probably too much force to keep an elderly occupant in their seat, which could cause thoracic um, injuries. To better protect a wider range of drivers, Ohio State researchers are working with automakers to rethink safety systems, starting with smaller models that more closely represent more fragile, older drivers. We're doing some studies to look at how strong are their ribs, how, how do they interact with the seat belt, potentially with airbags in, in a side impact uh, scenario. Even minor accidents often cause injuries along the seatbelt line, in the collarbone, ribs, and pelvis. In younger drivers, that's rarely serious. But someone that's older, um, a couple rib fractures, flail chest, problems breathing, pneumonia, it can really build up and cause a lot more issues. Now, experts say this research could lead to key fobs that know a driver's age, height, and weight and can adjust a car's seatbelts accordingly. Now, that's still a few years away, but it is critical since by 2030, there will be more than 60 million licensed drivers over the age of 65. And then giving somebody else your key fob then would change the calculation. I know, that's why I was not exactly yeah, sure wow. how that would work. but. Well, she lost her paycheck but regained her faith in humanity. How Good Samaritan gave this woman's story the best possible ending. Plus, does there seem to be something a little bit off about the ice in this rink? Find out why there's been such a backlash on social media over what's frozen into the ice. If you didn't do your shopping online today, don't worry. Experts say big deals are still coming. In fact, many could be posted later this week. I'm Hank Winchester. Help me, Hank, what you need to know to save money on your holiday shopping. New tonight. We've got a new at six. In order to have safety, safety, safety on campus, you have to have engagement, engagement, engagement on the part of students and staff. Coming up, I will show you why it is so important to engage with campus police to help keep you safe. All right, Paula, also nearly 40 million Americans smoke cigarettes, but quitting smoking is not the only thing experts are urging them to do. The life-saving measures smokers and ex-smokers are being urged to pursue coming up at 6. We are noticing a trend in holiday shopping. Uh, Black Friday is no longer just limited to Black Friday, and now the same's going with uh, Cyber Monday. Help me Hank. Hank Winchester has more. Hank. Don't worry. If you didn't do your shopping online this morning for Cyber Monday, there are still many great deals out there. Here on Amazon on children's toys, 50% off, 32% off, 16% off. And experts say many of these deals, they'll stick around all week. The big deals were posted early this morning, but many could stick around. 
Today, expect big bargains on electronics and popular toys for children. Earlier, I spoke with Sarah Skirbel. She's with RetailMeNot.com, a site tracking all the deals today. Walmart actually has over 50% off on Samsung HD TVs. You're also going to find some designer things on sale. So like Kate Spade, you're going to find 30% off site wide. But also if you're looking for something for the whole family, I would check out Kohl's who has a great 20% off deal. Here are some of the bargains we discovered. Target has an iPad Pro listed for $679.79. Amazon has a Samsung smartwatch that retails for $148, a 20% savings. Best Buy has a sharp 43-inch LED TV, $179.99, 30% off. And Sears has a Hamilton brand slow cooker for just $9. Today, you save more than 70%. Make sure you know who you're shopping for, what you're looking for, and get ready to take advantage of all the good deals out there. So definitely know who you need to shop for, like I said, what you're getting them, and also put a budget to their names so that, again, you're not just kind of out there on the internet shopping around and spending a ton of money. It's important to remember when shopping online to use a secure website and look for a site that has a customer service number in case you have any sort of issues. Here's what I suggest. Set up a separate shopping email account because none of us wants our personal email that we use to co communicate with friends and family to be full of shopping offers. We have more shopping advice from the experts regarding Cyber Monday and more deals that you can find right now. You'll find all that information on the Help Me Hank page at clickondetroit.com. I'm Hank Winchester. Back to you.